wherever you are, wherever you come from, I'm sure you can leverage your, you know, whatever, whatever you do to do something interesting and, and try at least, at least try. Episode 178. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I had the great honor of speaking with an old friend, a past colleague, Benjamin Garcia Sachs, who set up his own practice in San Jose in Costa Rica back in 2004. It was a wonderful conversation. I know Benjamin from our time together at Roger Sturck Harbour and Partners, now known as RSHP. Ben was a very influential designer uh, in the in the practice there, and he was already winning awards at that time while still working for Rogers. Um, one of his earliest projects, or I think his first project, which was an extension of his master's thesis, which was a home for his mother uh, and a kind of hand constructed bamboo shelter, if you like, or um, a very beautifully thoughtful moonlit space that really demonstrated the power of design and being able to make incredible, beautiful, atmospheric, moving, emotive spaces with the most simplest of resources. Um, And this is a a theme that kind of runs through a lot of um, Ben's work. Um, Since then, he moonlit, if you like, uh, whilst working at RSHP and was developing his own practice that initial project for his mother um, won a world architecture forum award it kind of went a little bit viral Um, it was published all over the place he started obviously getting lots of inquiries about other doing other work he shares the story of how Richard you know an RSHP worked very hard to keep him on as uh, you know in in his position in the practice and to nurture that talent there Um, but he was still doing projects on the side if you like and eventually he went full-time into developing studio sacks where he was working with some private residential clients so ben tells us that story he outlines some of the challenges of reconciling um, doing design work and leading a design work whilst running a profitable business um, and he talks about the importance of being an advisor to his clients. So one of the early ways that he was winning work with his clients was, was, was finding out ways to be of value to the client, which weren't purely in the realm of design. And that's very much a, a kind of relationship that he still uh, develops with prospective clients and existing clients to further the pipeline of work. Then also very entrepreneurially gifted and minded discusses Studio Sax's new ventures into being developers where they have just recently completed one of their own developments in San Jose in Costa Rica, um, a apartment residential block, which called the Gardenia. This is quite a extraordinary development. They acquired the land They did the development designs, sold a lot of it off plan, worked with people in finance to generate the construction um, budget and money, completed the project and made a bit of money out of it, basically. And it's a really wonderfully design-led development project. And this marks an important shift in the practice's history moving towards a different type of business model of being your own client. So Ben talks in at length about that process and the successes and the challenges of it, of being an architect developer, of being your own client, the risks that were involved um, and how they've successfully managed to navigate that. So this was a really wonderful uh, conversation. It was brilliant to be able to catch up with Ben again and reconnect uh, and his story really is very, very inspiring. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Benjamin Garcia Sachs of Studio Sachs. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. 
or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Benjamin, pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm hey. excited to talk a little bit about architecture with you. Fantastic. No, so we worked together briefly at RSHP for a, for a few years, maybe over a well, nearly a decade ago now. Um, and it's been really amazing to see your evolution. I remember uh, when we were at RSHP, you had just won the World Architecture Prize for your, it was your mother's house, wasn't it? Yeah, my mother's house, it, a very small, quaint structure. Just just a beautiful little project, kind of, it was a lot of it was handmade, right? And you were actually involved in the construction yourself and it was in yeah. the... So, yeah, yeah. I, um, I think I, I, I had to learn how to build in order to, to, um, to really hone in on what design was for me. That was the perfect platform. Amazing. And so, and so that was a project what you, you did and completed whilst at, um, at RSHP. You were involved in a lot of notable projects um, whilst at RSHP as, as well. Um, but around 2014 or 2013, you left and then with you and your, your your wife went back to Costa Rica and then started to concentrate more on your own practice. Yes, well, I think that um, the, the journey starts mostly um, when I was a kid. I was, I was adopted by an architect. So that wow. really influenced me a lot. I was adopted around five, yeah, five or six. And um, yeah, I was an architect, and I basically played you know, Legos underneath the, the drawing table. It was like yeah. that. And um, when I when I decided to to go into architecture, um, definitely very 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 influenced by him, and, and and hearing him say, you know, like I really would like to please people, to make people's lives better. And then um, you know, I thought that architecture you know had a purpose, um, and I decided to study architecture in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. um, Costa Rica is a place where I, where I believe the, the values, societal values, are are more about family. Like family mm -hmm. is very important, and um, so I, I really thought that I wasn't ready. And I I actually applied for you know the best school here, and I was rejected. <laughs> and um, it was a very very tough public school. And I thought you know am I really going to be a good architect? Am I going to mm -hmm. make it? So I I went to a private school, and. Um, and then after that, I said, you know, okay, five years later, I said, I, I would like to to, start, to go abroad and just um, just get to know the world. And I, I managed to go to, to Rhode Island School of Design, which is a, an, art, an art school, basically an art school in the States. And, um, and, and we're, you know, we're in Costa Rica. Costa Rica is poised very close to the States. We are, we are very influenced. So basically it was more like trying to understand the big brother. And... Mm -hmm. um, in the States, I, I did my, my graduate school three years. And over there, I had the opportunity of just doing almost what I wanted. And what I wanted to do is explore and build with materials. And uh, I was married, actually. I got married and then went to the States. So um, we had to, my wife had to work, I had to work. And, you know, U.S. schools are incredibly expensive. We had to have scholarships and the whole, the whole difficulties of, of being a student uh, from Latin America. Um, trying to trying to do that that graduate school and then um, my wife who was also a dancer got a placement in London and she said okay we're going to London and uh, it's my turn so it wasn't planned it wasn't like I was looking to go to London to work at RSHP I I, I was drawn and you know pulled by my wife to go to, to the UK I had a lot of job opportunities in New York City and, um, and, and, and it was easy, it was easy, it was there in the Northeast. But no, we went to London and, um, and one, you know, interviewed in many places. And I thought that uh, RSHP was there, really the right place, even though their, their offer per perhaps was not the best one. But I think the, the ethos of the practice that Richard Rogers created uh, was yeah. not something that I was drawn to. I think you were as well. And that's where yeah. we met. Absolutely amazing. So, so that's quite fascinating then you've you've had an upheaval you've you've kind of uh, made a new home in pretty serious cities on numerous occasions yes um we 
we had to, we, we wanted just to explore it. As a young married couple, we were 24, we wanted to explore yeah. the world. And even if we didn't get a job, we were just like bartender, whatever need, was needed. You know, it doesn't, wasn't, I think that was, that's a great thing about being with somebody that's so open to that. Mm-hmm. That you're not how you don't have to have uh, expectations that you can't meet, but actually together we can try and look for a goal and try to meet that goal in whatever means possible. And I think she had the goal of, of uh, you know, continuing on contemporary dance. And I had, yeah. I, I really wanted to learn from the best. And um, so I started from, from the ground, like really just uh, as nobody um, working in an office and just learning and learning and keeping my eyes, my eyes open. And um, I realized after some years, or maybe after four years, that there were some things that I wouldn't learn quickly there. They would take me too long. One of that, one of that was actual construction. Like I really yeah. wanted to build stuff. When I did my graduate school, it was all about welding, and using wood, you know, vacuum forming, 3D printing, and um, laser cutting and everything you can think of and doing stuff. Then I went to a, obviously a more corporate environment. It was all about computers, 3D modeling and making blueprints, you know. And, uh, yeah. and I confirmed that it had um, a very strong hierarchy in terms of uh, at a very old firm, you know. I couldn't get, get to just go and build something so quickly and projects take a long time. So I said, you know, I'm going to start doing things on my own in my own home country, Costa Rica, so that I can get a taste of building small things and, and learn from that. Because what does space feel like? You know, I don't know. I'm drawing it up in, th- in, in the computer, but I don't feel it. I don't know what it feels like. Mm-hmm. And it's also not necessarily my space. It's somebody else's idea of, yeah. you know, that I'm trying to interpret. So I wanted to make my own mistakes and I wanted to learn quicker, very impatiently wanted to, um, you know, move my educational experience further. So I, I saw this could be a great balance, you know, the large, huge projects, international scale, uh, that take a long time to develop and learn from real experienced architects. And then my own, you know, mistakes, just go and make my own mistakes in Costa Rica. And, and, and how long were you, were you doing that? And what was, were RSH, well, I know RSHP, they certainly became aware that you yes. were that you were doing it. We all did because you won you won some pretty amazing awards, and it was like right, okay, that's not that's not just a sort of little side side hustle thing. Yeah. Um, how how long and how did you manage that, and how was it received in the office? Um, you know, them knowing that you were working and doing your own practice, and did it ever cause any tensions or? Well, it, it was interesting. I started uh, with my mother's house, so yeah. um, in my mother's house was. Um, it was my thesis, my architecture thesis at the in my graduate school. So right. you can imagine. Maybe I go back a little bit. You know, I'm gonna we're gonna go back and forwards a little bit here. But I sure. was adopted. What does? Uh, Why well, was adopted from a person? My mom who was not well. She was into drugs. Uh, she couldn't take care of me. I was a, I was a kid in the streets mostly. Um, mm-hmm. You know, some didn't have to anything to eat for a while. Maybe neighbors and family members would help me out and give me something. But you know, I was really a street kid, and um, wow. so I always had contact with my mom, and she was always not well. Um, so when I went to study in the states in this prestigious university, I was like, "All well, my friends maybe were designing skyscrapers." I was like, "What am I doing? You know, like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this?" And so I said, "You know, I want to design a house for my mother." And uh, she was living in a, in a shack, basically, that she created for herself in a sort of a shanty place, you know? Yeah. So I was like, okay, like, you know, I give her something with dignity, at least. So I designed the place for her. And uh, the basis of that design was she told me that um, she placed, she built her play home place with like, trick, with, like tarp and metal sh- stuff and whatever she could find. But she placed the bed in a corner so she could look at the moon at night. And she said that was important to her. She, she thought of me when she looked at the moon. So what I designed is I just designed a home that she could do that. She could like, lay on her bed and look up into the roof and there was an opening and the moon was there. And I would, you know, I would give her that moon at night and, and really make a connection in time and space with her and also be dignified and secure 
beautiful. And I, I literally grabbed all that material that she had accumulated and I reused all of it. Plus, of course, I put some of my own savings at working from RSHP. And I, every time I got a holiday, I came, I came down and I built it with the help of local people. And in time, we, we, we created the house. And in 2009, 2008, 2009, you know, there was a depression. You know, there was a pretty terrible crash. And uh, I was like, well, you know, maybe this is the opportunity of uh, showing people that it's not all about the money. It's not about how much money you have. You can have a beautiful home. You can really do something beautiful with very little, with almost nothing. And um, so I, I put this house in different, you know, show showcase it in different places. And uh, it won several awards, and, and including the World Architecture Festival Award. Interestingly mm-hmm. enough, RSHP had won one of those awards the year before for the first time. So, yes, when I, when, I, when people realized, Richard, Richard Rogers called me over and he said, you know, one of my first projects was my mother's home, you know, uh, that was one, one project that for me was, uh, you know, it, it taught me about like, what are my values and what, what I want and the importance of architecture. So, you know, I told him, look, uh, I, I have offers from so many people. I now, everybody wants to work with me because I, you know, have a lot of press. And so I'm leaving, I'm basically leaving because this is, this is my chance. Like everybody's <laughs> going to forget tomorrow, you know? And there's all these offices that have offered me new jobs, etc. So he said, "No, no, no. We, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna try to keep you." And so they, they really um, made a big effort to give me a lot of responsibility, and uh, to really, you know, make me comfortable, and to mm-hmm. to allow me to to express myself in my designs. And, um, and so they they really, you know, I'm so grateful. And it all mm-hmm. came from Richard. He's he really thought that I that I had something to, to give to the company. And, and so, yeah, that's how I ruined the company. I basically um, did this thing on the side. So that, that helped me. And uh, then I really kept my mouth shut about doing more, more work. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I didn't tell many people that I was doing other stuff on the side because I couldn't, I couldn't you know, you have to be respectful. And... I really sure. did it on my own time. I did it on my weekends and I very late nights and I it didn't let let it affect my my job. And um, but I was happy to do stuff that that was my creation and that uh, mm-hmm. and I really wanted to test things out. And one of those first projects was for a British couple. They were living in Costa Rica and I was living in London. And sometimes they would come to London and sometimes I would go to Costa Rica and we would ex- you know interchange and so. For them, it was interesting to have a Costa Rican living in London, designing their home in Costa Rica, and uh, and it was all it's all it's all about like human connections, you know, real yeah. real human connections. They thought that because I was at RSHP, you know, that I really was a capable architect, and mm-hmm. so that reputation of being an RSHP helped me gain a project in Costa Rica, and also my mother's award and all that. So I think it's a it's a, a series of events that and that start compounding. Because that family then um, introduced me to the next project, and then that one to the next one, and they created a snowball effect of people talking about about the work that we were doing. And I don't think it's the work itself. I think it's like protecting people from from the environment that they're coming into. Mm-hmm. They're coming to a new country. Can you imagine coming yeah. to a country in Latin America. You know, things could happen. So what I would do is I would you know, really protect them, you know, with my, my, my contacts, my friends, my circle, and let them be successful in my country. And so they were actually telling others about the success they were having with me and how I would, um, you know, really be their friend and help them out. And design was almost something they didn't understand. What's design? They were more, mostly hiring me because of, because of that. And uh, so I think most people don't necessarily hire people only for design. They, they hire them mm-hmm. for other reasons, which began that, 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 that understanding that, that maybe I could convince people of things if they trusted me first. You know? So interesting. So, so actually you were, you were being a, a trusted advisor on many different things and in many different areas. You're and still that same. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. I'm, I'm, I'm interested, you know, you're, I can see visually elements of 
RSHP, you know, expressive structure and the kind of sort of philosophies of modernism that Rich might have embodied. What were some of the ethos and business philosophies that that you you got from Rogers? And I know already you, you've, you've kind of started to point towards the, the the power of architecture as being something social and something protective and something good for people. What were some what some of the ethos or some of the business? the way that Richard did business that might have rubbed off on you or did he give you any advice or? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that um, the first thing that comes to mind when you're talking about the business side is um, this year to not uh, have necessity. Uh, and because I had such a rough first five years, I'm very grateful for them mm. because that created a very strong character. But I really had, like, I really had, from that moment, even in school, in high school, in elementary school, and whatever, I had to be the best, and I had to almost destroy everybody else to do it. Like, it was, like, bad. Like, so um, I had to, like, you know, really, really um, uh, be strong about it. So that it, it's a good thing, and it's a bad thing. Of course, I, I, I can, you know, along the way, I probably made a lot of, enemies and, and I hurt people but and I, so I realized when I when I went to Rogers that you could have a, a benevolent success you know you don't have to be the despot architect and uh, to be a successful architect uh, we have many sample examples around the world of the people that are just you know unbelievably rude and and, and perhaps they just um, I don't know they're like that because they're strong personalities come forth in a way that perhaps is, is is not what I wanted and perhaps it was what I was going towards. And so what I saw in Richard was um, a, was an interest in the human in the human in, the, in a positive in a more positive way. And also this idea that you can be doing incredible projects that are competing in the highest level, even at the corporate level against the big big guns and still have a boutique um, firm and still be design oriented. And so mm. you don't have to leave design. With design meaning just the quest for quality of life of human beings. I think design is just not something that something that looks good. No, I think it's that quest for beauty, order to give others that to, to give others a better quality of life, and um, and not just economic, you know, churn. So I, I thought that um, that um, that he managed to to be able to dabble in both uh, really well. And so in my own practice. I have been looking for that balance. I don't want to be the lone ranger art, artist or architect that, um, that is insufferable perhaps because of my ego, but does amazing art. And then I don't want to be perhaps a corporate office that is just uh, about the bottom line, you know, churning out projects to make a huge profit to be very wealthy. Or I don't even know if you can be very wealthy as an architect. Bro, there's one, one or two in the world, but, you know, to be well off. But uh, so I wanted to be sustainable in an, in an economic sense, and I wanted to have an order of, of corporate environments without losing the art. And we're, we're still looking for that balance every day. We're 40 people now, and that's a difficult task to be, to be mm -hmm. you know, to be boutique and to be personally oriented, but, and at the same time have a, a, a company that is uh, profitable and people that come here feel like they can make a career here, you know, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of like turning over in artistic firms because people get burned out or they don't have the right salary. So they're like, it's a, it's a moment in their lives, but they don't see themselves. Yeah. Long. I want people to feel like they could, they could be here and have a family. They could be here and, mm. and be happy and, and be stable and not feel like their job is going to fade away at any moment. Even though the world we live in is incredibly volatile. I, it's it's a sort of persona, a father figure that wants to create stability, something yes. else that I I think I got from Richard. Amazing. Um, how have you managed growth in the business? Then, how have you kind of either have you actively capped it at certain points, or at other points has it been a struggle to grow? How have you? been managing growth and facilitating it and you know this this kind of ties in with knowing when to say no to certain projects and which projects to pursue yes and in that respect 
I'm always a yes guy. I am always um, positive and I'm always give the benefit of the doubt to people. And that has yeah. um, really hurt the beginnings, uh, our beginnings, because I couldn't, I couldn't dis dis discern appropriately. And I couldn't also hire a, where people would go in the right places because I wasn't trained. And I was, and I, I think that's something you do learn to read people and to understand their strengths and their weaknesses. So in time, I realized to put people in the right location, to put people where they're going to flourish. And in time, I learned to say no to projects that I know are not going to be successful because economically, they just don't have, they have nowhere to go. And, um, and because perhaps the, 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 the ethos of the, pro, of the client themselves is not aligned with ours. And it's hard to do that when you have to pay, you know, every month a big, big amount of money to, to make this survive, to have a huge project and, and, and say no to that. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that um, my wife and I, we took the decision of like um, setting ourselves like lower expectations in life in terms of our, how we want to be and want to live, what is happiness. And I do think that that is Costa Rican. Costa Rican, the Costa Rican mindset is all about um, trying to be happy with what you have wherever you are at the moment, you can see that a lot in the culture. And um, so I think that, you know, um, we're not necessarily in an incredibly strong rat race to have everything. We're mostly interested in, uh, in doing every day something we love if we can, because of course there's always issues and troubles to deal with and fires to put out, but at least if we're working on something that is, uh, is exciting, we are like um, doing it for a reason. So that's what we're trying to do. If not, we go back to just doing it for the money, then you might, we might as well do other types of businesses because um, the architecture, at least in the design part of architecture, it's a very difficult business to make a lot of money. That leads us to, to a point where we are now, which is we, we are becoming slowly developers as well. And uh, yes. maybe something um, you know, to also talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, just going back to um, what you were talking about in terms of ethos and turning away big projects, and this is something that lots of architects struggle with, is knowing when to say no. And actually, by saying yes to the wrong project, you've, said, you've, you've effectively said no to thousands of other different opportunities. How do you make sure that your ethos is aligned with a prospective client that perhaps you've only met a handful of times, how do you how do you kind of mitigate the risk of getting it wrong? Oof. Um, I think that one quality that I that I have since I was a kid is to be able to read people very well. Um, I really, really thought I might be I, I was going to study psychology or psychiatry or something. I really have something that, that I was born with that I, I really can feel people really well and get it, get it right and understand. And, and um, that is something that has helped me a lot in just in general, because I can hire better. I can feel people in terms of their project, ask the right questions and, and just feel them out really well. And that's helped me a lot. Then I've also um, have a good team that can, then I can have a lot of feedback. So I, I bring a lot, uh, several people, key people to the table that have their own mind, that they, they don't want to please me at all. I, don't, I really don't want to be told what I want to hear. So it's hard to find that type of people and, uh, and that they can also provide feedback, uh, unbiased feedback as well. And so we've managed to create a, a team that together we're managing to get like 90% you know, right. Um, and yes, we got, we got some difficult clients, um, but in most of the time we're finding out lately that we're, we're being successful in bringing in the right type of people. I think I, I, I'm saying bringing in because we're looking, we're looking for, for the right type of people. They're, we're just not waiting for them to fall in our lap. We're actively, um, trying to see and trying to be present in people's minds and trying to be and trying to find those projects that are, we are the right fit and um, that's also something that, that that I learned that marketing and communications and um, 
and getting yourself out there to, so that people that you want come to you because that you could be bringing in a lot of people you don't want to work with. So how do you yes. uh, do that? And I think, um, you know, for example, the type of imagery, the type of that we use, the type of um, projects that we do that speaks for themselves and the values. So sometimes we we can never speak to these people and the, the projects need to, to express the values, right? They, they, they need to speak for themselves. We can't be next to a project saying what it, why it was like that. So when people come to us and they tell us, oh, we like this because of this, this, and that, we're like, yes, that's exactly what we're doing. And um, so you, you, the, the project spoke to you what we wanted to, and, uh, and we're here talking about now your project. So I think that was like, that was interesting to, 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 to like learn, like, like the mm-hmm. experience of learning through doing like that and making mistakes has been really amazing. I don't regret um, really going through all this because I've learned a lot. So in terms of making sure that your public image or your messaging or that the, the work is being represented in a, in a way that you want it to be represented out in the public sphere, um, how, do you, how do you ensure that that's, that that's the case? And, and is there any kind of strategic way that you go and find specific clients or make sure that that, that imagery is put in the right places? Mm-hmm. So that the right people see it. Yeah, since since the very beginning, even in my mother's house, I realized that I'm a very, very, very small fish, um, with with in a country far away that many people don't even know where it is. Was it was mm-hmm. going to be very difficult to to get jobs, you know? And so I started drilling very hard personally on on communication. So I started personally looking into a type of um, medium that I thought was the right one, that was interested in this type of uh, you know, design. And, um, and so I made connections at, the, at that level, at that global level. I started saying, oh, I'm from Costa Rica, this is what we're doing, this is the type of stuff. Obviously some awards helped in that, but um, I realized the power of communication and that, we, that nobody was ever gonna you know, go, come to these projects and feel them for themselves. That, that investing in photography, videography, and investing in also in people that would copyright to, uh, was important because I am not, not a native English speaker and, um, you know, using professionals. And many small firms uh, don't, don't spend any money on that. Right? Like they, they, don't, they yeah. don't have the money. And I didn't have the money either. So I just literally did myself and then I started like hiring and paying people. And to the point that today we have a very robust communications department, and um, where we have a robust, um, you know, allocation of of money for mm-hmm. for for that. And I think in the world, in the modern world, uh, if you're not there, how are you going to be known? How are you, people going to know your story, your, in you know what what you're about? Um, and so yes, we we are constantly also working with external professionals to help us uh, you know, achieve that. And, but uh, very, I, I meet many small firms and medium firms that are not investing a cent on that. And I, and I say, like, that doesn't make any sense because that's where people are going to see you. That's where people are going to read about you. Yeah. Even in Costa Rica, people find us that way. And um, so, yes, I think that that was powerful since my mother's house. Um, what, who do you have involved in your marketing team internally? Oh, um, we have people that are not ar- non architects, and uh, we have yep. also uh, like my my wife's brother, who was a graphic designer. Brilliant. Graphic designer. Um, mm-hmm. uh, we have um, external, con- for example, um, people from from the UK, from the US, um, and we are looking always for 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 agencies who can help us. Normally, people. Small people that are independent are better for us rather than a huge company that that we are just not the right fit. Uh, but internally, uh, we have to feed the architects and the designers. We have an architecture, interior design, and landscape design three three main departments. We have to feed the, the communication department with with what we're doing constantly. So we make mm-hmm. forums where we teach the administrative department what we're doing and the co- accounting, legal. And communications and everybody. Why? Because 
they don't understand why we're spending more money on a project and not making any money. Well, because we are guided mostly by, yes, sustainable, a global sustainable strategy for the office, but if we have to lose some money for a project to be done correctly, we'll do so if we have to, because our ethos is about, at the end of the day, the project being done correctly. And uh, so we, we we're constantly, I don't think we're constantly communicating amongst ourselves what, why are we doing and what are we doing this? Because if we don't do that, then people get maybe even depressed that because it's so tough to be an architect that if you don't mm -hmm. check yourself constantly about why you're doing this, you might get flooded with the everyday menial and then you are, you know, you're like, why am I doing all this? So you have to be reminding mm -hmm. all the time, why are we doing this? And then the fights have a reason. It was interesting. You were saying earlier that it's it's difficult. It's difficult to become wealthy or to make money as an architect, right? To make a lot of money as an architect. Why do you think it's so difficult? I think it's difficult be uh, mainly because architects um, are not people that um, that are interested in creating businesses or they're business oriented. They're they're more. They would be even philanthropic. I would say. They are interested in design and the, in their art and the beauty and the, and the product itself. Most people that I know that are interested in that and not necessarily in, uh, in just money. They would just, well, of course, everybody wants money, but not, they don't necessarily have the tools to, and to know how to make it. And, um, and mm -hmm. I, you see people that have no education and have no universal, and they are com very wealthy, right? Because they sold, uh, they even sold cupcakes when they're in elementary school. Like they've always been, you know, they've always been entrepreneurial. And I do believe yeah. that I have uh, an entrepreneurial um, aspect to me driven by this, the factor that I really want to be okay. So I've learned, mm -hmm. I've taught myself about how to be an entrepreneur. And I think most architects are not, are not, uh, are not that and they don't want to be that. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think it's interesting, you know, looking at somebody like Richard, for example, clearly a very gifted business person and entrepreneur and ability to network and, and, and market. And there are these handful of architects um, who, who, who have embraced business, if you like. Yes. I, or, or found a way to reconcile it with, with design. Yeah, I think that at the end of the day, the, good, the, the interesting thing about architects is that we can be happy designing projects that we are excited about. Like, like um, I think like a, an incredibly interesting way of being an architect is to be a teacher and, and, to, and mm -hmm. to have your own practice. I think that's a, like an amazing balance because you can get, you know, you, have, you can get that both sides. You have the, 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 you know, the street, you have all the problems of getting a project done, then you have the ideals and concepts of being in school and being able to get fresh, fresh ideas and, and, and have a, a nice, beautiful life. Uh, I think for me, that would also be a really cool thing to do. I mean, who knows, maybe in the future, that's what I would do. Love it. Um, so you moved into development. What was the reason for that? And how did this, how this project come about? Well, um, I realized that most of our clients were making tons of profits from our design efforts. And, and really, no joke, like we were killing ourselves for the projects to be amazing. And our, some of our clients yes. didn't even know or perhaps even didn't even care. And we were like mostly doing everything for them and even setting up the business models for them. And, and we were like, what are we doing? Like, these people are coming from abroad. Nobody knows them. They're using our brand that's known in this country to be a good brand. And then using a reputation, using all this effort that we're putting in, even putting up their business models. And then they're being really successful and we're just being get, we're just getting paid a consultancy. And sometimes we're not even paid that consultancy. But you, you, pay. And you have you have to chase you have to chase to get paid. Chase them and, up yeah. and we're like what are we doing? Like, are we insane? We're leveraging our brand and our know-how and we're getting very little from that. And so uh, we, we started with, um, I started saying, 
hey, there's, uh, you know, why don't we develop our own apartment building in the city of San Jose? City of San Jose is easier because it's not in the jungle. We have all everything to hand, and we have all our contacts and know-how, and we really know our way around. So we 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 decided to um, put together this plan of uh, design of a building, sell it, pre-sell it to our friends and family. And I was really skeptical. Like nobody's gonna buy this build, this apartment from us. And um, and in one month we sold every single apartment. And I was like, what? No way! Like people trust us. People trust us with their money, and people put money down. I was, I was, I was like, oh my God, this is ridiculous. What am I doing? So, so, so you were, you were able to sell the whole lot off plan, off plan before in one month. Built. To be, because people believed in us, because people believed in the brand that we we're not gonna, we we're not gonna take advantage of them. That we we're gonna deliver something that was beautiful. And so now the pressure mm-hmm. is on us, right? Like we need to deliver under a price that's given on a beautiful and, a, and something beautiful. So we we did everything. We, we designed it. We we got all the permits. We developed it. We bid it out with builders, we, we became developers and we took care of the money and payments and everything you can think of until we finished it. We built it during the pandemic. We built it during the worst time and uh, it was already pre-sold and we finished it and people are so happy. And the worst thing is that now it was such a clash between what's around it. It's so much better than everything that's around it that people now want more of it, right? So um, we didn't skimp on anything. Like we did the best quality of everything you can think of. We could, and and uh, and most developers are not. You know, most developers are trying to to do get the best profit, and we were okay with a certain profit margin. We were even okay, maybe not even making any any money, as long as we didn't lose money, and. Um, and we, we were successful. Now a lot of people now really trust us and now they really can see that we can deliver and that everybody that's there is happy and they can. And so now we're gonna do more, of course. We're gonna do more. We're gonna, and we can see that the profit margins for that are a lot more than, than any consultancy in architecture. And so we can re- we realize that, 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 you know, that having full control of a project from, de- from design all the way to development allowed us to create a design mm-hmm. that no developer could do because the developers don't have the design sensibility that we have. So we bring value that nobody else has. So all of a sudden, yeah. we have a value which is design that is an intangible element that creates something that's better with almost the same budget as everybody else because as we said, with my mother's house, we did something beautiful with nothing. And I believe design is that. Like We can really transform any material into something beautiful. Mm-hmm. That's our, that's our, uh, you know, the thing we can do. And, and so now people are understanding, at least in this region, that architects are not a luxury that rich people can, you know, can afford, but actually paying for an architect, they can use with the same budget, they can do something better. Thus they can rent for more, they can sell for more. So if they are more expensive, that's fine because it's offset by, then you're starting to think like a business person. You're starting to tell that to your clients and they're like, yeah, for sure. Makes total sense. So, in terms of the current like work that you've got on in the office, your your main clientele previously was a lot of high end residential, perhaps some hotel hospitality work. So, were you not were you working with developers prior to being a developer? Um, it's interesting because when we started, a lot of um, fellow architects were telling me. Oh yeah, you're doing a bunch of high-end homes, and I'm laughing on the inside because I know that like they look really high-end, they look really good, but they're made with a shoestring budget, with the same budgets they have it. So um, that was, for me was was important that that things look better than what look better than what they are. So it, I would almost call it a hocus pocus magic magic art. <laughs> Really doing, uh, making things feel a lot, uh, and our first clients, they were not wealthy at all. They were like, uh, maybe like a couple, 26 years old from Sweden who had just a little bit of money from their parents and they had to do 
a boutique hotel and they, and we were like let's do you know this amazing thing and they were living in a camper van and um in really on a shoestring budget and they made this amazing boutique hotel that looks really good and they can charge a lot of money for people to stay there but i know what it is you know and then we did most of our initial projects were like that they were like really really um difficult projects in terms of their budgets and so i wouldn't call them developers at all i would call them people with a dream people wanting to leave their their homes and wanting to to you know try and do something different in a, in a foreign country and um and so we were we were friends uh, you know we were really trying to do this together as we as we got it got reputation yes people that were developers of projects came to us and if they had the right mindset we would help them out a great opportunity for us to create a portfolio of work um mm -hmm. and uh, and they a great opportunity to make an amazing business and and good for them that you know they can tell us look because of design people are staying here people that come here like you know like they're, they're design oriented people so they like nice things and they like that type of stuff mm -hmm. versus the the other lodges who that are just a little bit shabby you know so there isn't there yeah. wasn't a, 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 a huge amount of modern tropical design um, so I think we brought a, a type of freshness of modernity to a place where it's hard to do that and um, you were talking about the influence of style of Richard Rogers uh, we were using modern contemporary materials mixed in with local materials that created an aesthetic on its own. Mm. And so you've never felt like then moving into being your own developer that you're treading on the toes of potent, like past clients or potential clients or that other developers are going to see oh, you yeah. as the competition now. 100%. Or, or... I am the competition. Yeah. <laughs> I am the competition and I am completely um, taking a lot of work from you. Um, and, and I know that, right. but, um, but they would never hire me because they wouldn't mm. be able to pay our fees and they wouldn't understand the value that we bring. So, and they're, and they're doing stuff that is even offensive for the city. So yeah. we're like, you know, okay, you're, you're not going to change. You're never going to change. So we're, we can't, we can't wait for you. Like we can't wait for you to change. And so we have to do something about this. And um, so it's important that what we do is not that, right? It's really important that everything we do is really um, the opposite of that. And it's, and it's good with it's the environment and it's, and it's all these things and it creates its own energy and it recycles its own water and it, and it, you know, it brings natural nature to the city, back to the city, and it does a lot of things. So, and that is difficult to, to make work from a financial point of view. We will make less money than they will, for sure. But it doesn't matter, right? It, it, it's not about the bottom line, again. So I think they know it and they, we even speak about it. We, I, I'm now friends with some developers and we, we speak about it, they know it. They say, look, we, we're, 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 we're going for the bottom line, you're not, that's completely fine. You're gonna take some of our clients uh, that are interested in that, but most, most of society is not interested in that. They're just interested in the cheapest apartment they can buy. And they're absolutely right, mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. and so we we are very real. Re we're realists, uh, you know. I, we're not kidding ourselves, and um, we're just trying to make us change one one project at a time. Mm -hmm. So, in in terms of your your business model, um, you're selling, you're 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 acquiring a piece of land, then you're going through whatever planning regulations that you need to do. Get the get some of the schematics, the drawings, the vision in place, then you're selling off yeah. plan, which is then funding the construction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And are you working with investors or any other kind of finance or bridging yeah, finance? Yeah, in the beginning we loans? wouldn't get any financing from any banks or anybody because nobody knew who we were. Right. And we couldn't have any collateral. Yeah. So we literally were working with people's money. And um, so there was a lot of money to be put up up front. Uh, but there their final product was, I would say, 30, 40% lower than market value. So they knew they were putting a lot of money up front, but their upside was huge. But now that it's built, they're getting 100%. Like they're, they're getting a lot more because, it's, because there's very few of it and it's very beautiful. So now there's a lot of people that want it. 
-hmm. So they are getting a huge upside and now they're telling their friends. And so now every single bank wants to lend us and a lot of private investors. But mostly the people that went with us at the beginning, this first project, now they really want to go and do another one with us. They're, most of them really want to yeah. invest in the second one. And I would, I would call them investors. I, would, I, I, I think they, they are investors. They feel like that. They feel less like buyers and more like investors. They're part Amazing. of the vision. Amazing. They are completely ingrained in the vision. They, they understand what we're doing and they're completely on board. And that's how we sell it. There's no like, there's not selling a fantasy. Like we, what we're speaking here, this is how we speak amongst each other, you know? And they're, they're like-minded. So it, it is, so is it the, the move for the business then to completely move away from doing client-based work and then be doing solely project, I mean, you know, self-generated development work, or do you want to maintain the mix? Yes, I think we want to add the bread and butter work of the, uh, what I call the family home. And it's, it's, a, it's a project where yeah. the profit margins are very low because we're dealing with people's emotions and people's, and people's mm -hmm. uh, dreams. But the family home represents mm -hmm. the epitome of human, of human complexity. Um, how to live, how to eat, how to interact, and the, and the psychological aspect of architecture is deeply ingrained, especially when people move to a foreign country, changing their lives. So we're, we're at the crossroads of people changing, you know, coming from London and coming to a new place and changing their whole lives and wanting to change their lives. So we're there like, okay, you want to be healthier. Okay, you want to you know, change the dynamic of your own family. We're here to create an architecture uh, that's new that we don't know what it is so together we're going to do that so we're definitely uh, going to do that um, and we are definitely going to do hotels boutique hotels that um, that want to give people an experience of, uh, of connection to nature like hotels that are really focused on on well-being I think well-being and connecting with nature is going to be something that we always want to do and there's a lot of opportunities here and there's people that when they leave these places, they cry. Like they're transformed in terms of like what they what they felt and how how they now see. Like the first time they 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 uh, sm smelled, I don't know, um, the water, the rain hitting the ground. Or the first time they saw the stars that way. The first time they realized that the electricity went out and they had a they played games, board games with the family for the first time. They let their iPods and they just had a family time. First time they connected, uh, you know, husband and wife for 20, 20 years. Um, so, like, we're there. You know, we're there thinking about those moments for them. It's, it's an incredibly beautiful thing. And we always want to do that. And um, But certainly uh, we want to do, for example, we would like to do homes that we could rent that are part of our patrimony or yep. like a family patrimony. So we would like to do rental homes uh, that, uh, for people. Maybe someday we will do our own boutique hotel. Who knows? Uh, running a hotel is another world. Um, but I think it's something that we're interested in. My wife told me the other day she wanted to have, she wanted to run a cafe, a cafe in, in a little shop to see, to see how running a cafe, I mean, that could be a nightmare. We'd probably not make any money. But she wants to do it and see how it is. And I think we're just, you know, we, we want to test things out and see. And we're probably going to continue testing things out until forever. If not, it's going to be a boring life. I love it. Ben, I think that's the perfect place for us to conclude the conversation. There's so much more I could ask you about as well, but I think that's that's just been so massively inspiring your your personal story, um, the growth of the business, and just the way that how beautifully eloquent you are about talking about the, the power of architecture. So thank you so much for your uh, time this afternoon. Much appreciated. Thank you, Ryan. I know that um, uh, since we've met, you've also grown a lot and uh, very proud of your, the work and disseminating the good ideas of architecture. And I'm so um, happy to be able to share with you and your audience uh, the experiences we're, we're having here. I think they could be held anywhere in the world, you know. Also reevaluating your own country. People leave you their countries and they go to cities and sometimes um, even my I think of Costa Rica is, oh my Costa Rica you know and we don't have all these opportunities it's very difficult we don't have all this 
They were like, no, like wherever you are, wherever you come from, I'm sure you can leverage your, you know, whatever, whatever you do to do something interesting and, and try at least, at least try. You can fail. It doesn't matter if you don't, if you don't care about failing, it doesn't really matter. Who cares? <laughs> love it love it brilliant thank you so All much right. ben. take care and that's a wrap and don't forget if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom fulfillment and profit please visit smartpracticemethod.com or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly follow the link in the information the views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable. <laughs>